sign-ins have kind of tapered off and uh, we're not gonna wait for stragglers. So, um, hello, I'm Tudor Thomas. I'm the CTO of Drones Made Easy. Uh, we create uh, Maps Made Easy, the image processing platform and the map pilot suite of applications. Um, we have uh, a couple of staff on, on the call. It looks like there's a lot of people from New Zealand, uh, some Canadians, some South Africans. So it's uh, quite a group we have going on here. It sounds like everybody is locked in and being responsible, staying inside, not running around, coughing on people and stuff. So anyway, we're gonna get right to the start. I have no idea um, what the background of most of you are. Um, so, you know, I, I'm gonna start with the very basics, um, you know, kind of exactly what all of this is, um, do some basics on uh, cameras, what they are, what they do, um, and a little bit about how we do what we do and why uh, MapPilot does some of the things it does. Um, and then after we handle the data collection side of things, we will move on to um, the uh, data collect, or, after we go past the introduction stuff, we'll go to the data collection stuff. So I'm um, just going to get started. Um, so what the goal for everybody pretty much is um, that's, that's getting on this call is to learn more about mapping, uh, creating a map, kind of a up, up to date, uh, customized, time sourced uh, map of fields or construction sites or golf courses. Uh, I think the New Zealand people are all timber and forestry related. So um, everybody kind of has their own need for it. Um, the execution and how you do it uh, kind of varies on what your requirements are. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So, um, you know, for the sake of completeness, we're gonna start with a basic understanding um, of cameras and some of the imaging stuff. Um, if you're really gonna get into this seriously, uh, it would definitely help to know things, um, you know, the underlying technical parts of this uh, a little better to fully understand what's going on. Um, but just to get up in mapping and using MapPilot, um, you can use the defaults for the data collection. Um, they're designed to make everything pretty much foolproof. So um, the way maps are created is through a per process called photogrammetry. Now, photogrammetry is basically the process of triangulating 3D positions using images that are taken from known locations um, and getting multiple looks at something. So I have a link here. Um, I will post it in the chat window and hopefully you get that. So um, I think if you open your questions tab, you'll see kind of a running dialogue of um, of bits of text, I'll send these out kind of as we go. Um, so photogrammetry, I need to share that screen, give me a sec. Okay, so hopefully you should now be able to see, yep, you can see it. So um, I am basically, this is some blog I found that has a picture that I think is a pretty good representation of what photogrammetry is trying to do. Um, through the prospects of photogrammetry, you're taking a lot of images of the same object in succession uh, from different angles. And what those different images from different angles allow you to do is triangulate the positions of things kind of in a 3D space. So if the camera is in one place, pointing at one location and then it moves 20 feet the other way and is still pointing at the same location, um, based on how features are matched in the um, it, common features between successive images or images that include the same objects, um, we can kind of back out 3D positions to those things. And that turns into a 3D model, which then gets textured um, using the images uh, and kind of gives you a colorized 3D model, which is what you're seeing here. But then also uh, we can then orthorectify it uh, which means to take, you know, to sample that 3D, that textured 3D model, I'm gesturing down here, um, to uh, texture that 3D model and then sample it from overhead, so orth orthogonal to the ground. So you're not getting perspective of buildings um, and trees and things like that, and it should be top down. Um, so 
this is kind of what the image images collection looks like. Um, and then this here is a representation of all the images out of some data set uh, that include this little point here. So uh, examples that we are um, looking at, I'm gonna post those in the chat. Um, this is just somebody's map uh, that got processed as a free map. Oh man, my internet is having fun because my kids are upstairs watching Frozen. All right. Anyway, um, so this is a typical output that our MapsMate EC system will put out. Um, if you're, you know, this is the data collection and introduction part of things. So you're not going to get, uh, you know, people use their own software um, to, to process things all the time. Um, we are an, an option for that. Map Pilot is an option for collecting data. Uh, we happen to think it's the most comprehensive and feature-rich uh, version out there. Um, we, we've heard that other services recommend that they use our app because it's better. So, um, but this is a uh, a map that you can see. I'm trying to zoom in gradually. Uh, you can get a lot of detail out of it. So this one I think was about half inch GSD, which is ground sampling distance. So that's you know you can see a lot of detail on this ladder here. You can see you know, some kind of details, line details and things like that. Um, and that's what resolution will get you. And we'll touch on that a little later. Um, but, you know, so the goal of all this is to make your own map. So you can see this bright green uh, area here that I'm kind of mousing over. Um, you can hide that. So that's what's in Google Earth, Google Maps. And that is what is in Google or what you make using Maps Made Easy after collecting the data using that pilot. And then this is a 3D, a shaded colorized 3D relief layer um, that kind of just shows you, uh, it's, it's mapped to the, you can see the color code at the bottom and it gives you the elevations. So um, that is all kind of the goal. Um, we'll uh, uh, keep this up for now. So to, to do all of this, uh, the goal is to take a lot of pictures and you take a lot of pictures with a camera. So aerial mapping is important because it allows you to kind of control when and where you're going to be taking this data. So using a camera on a drone is, is a much cheaper way of doing it than it used to be done. Uh, I've, I've been doing this for whoa, 18 years now or something like that. Uh, and we were, I, I used to be doing this with military aircraft and uh, private commercial aircraft with customized camera payloads on very large uh, gimbals, uh, up to 10 and 12 inch gimbals. So um, now it's like, and you know, that stuff costs millions and millions of dollars. Uh, now it's, you go and buy a Mavic from, uh, you know, Drones Made Easy for, a thousand bucks or something like that. And you can go out and take images and do all the processing. And it's, you know, fast, you know, fast forward 18 years or so from, you know, the early, early 2000s. And uh, now you can do this stuff for free on our site uh, with, with equipment that costs less than a thousand dollars. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, but the, the screen I have up here that I'm sharing, um, there's a million of this picture out on, the, not the eyeball thing, uh, this top one here, which is basically a description of what a camera is. Um, you've all heard, probably heard the term of a camera obscura, which is a simple pinhole camera. And there's kind of a picture of it down below. Uh, that was one of the earliest cameras um, that didn't have any glass optical elements, elements in it. But um, if you look here on the left, uh, where I'm mousing over, you can see the uh, the camera body, um, which you know on, on these aircraft is a uh, a little camera hanging on a gimbal, uh, stabilized by a gimbal hanging under a, a, a small unmanned aerial system. So what that is doing is collecting light that's coming through the lens and basically from a certain area on the ground collect collecting this light. So you know, a couple things go into that. Um, you know, there's the sensor, which is, you know, it used to be film, now it's a sensor. That sensor is made up of pixels, uh, or, or it's an array of, a CCD is a charged coupled device, uh, which is a, a an array, a two-dimensional array of light sensing elements. And those elements basically turn into the pixels of your image. Um, 
So part of determining what a camera will collect is the size of the, uh, the imaging element. I'm trying to keep this not technical, uh, but it comes into, th it comes into play um, when we start talking about overlap and image footprint. So we're going to kind of go over this, trying to do it quickly. It's a, it's a big topic, so we're going to kind of try to do the hits and uh, you know you can look up the uh, the technical stuff behind it but so you have the image array here uh, which is the sensor in the back of your camera you have the lens which is in your camera and you have the distance between the aperture of that camera and the sensor and that is the back focal length um, that or the focal length of the camera which is or it's not that but for, for all intents and purposes with these types types of cameras that's the focal length so um, you take that distance in relation to the dimensions of the CCD. So if the CCD is a quarter inch CCD or a one over two thirds uh, inch CCD, um, you know you have a sense you have a a sensor that's roughly half an inch uh, in, in dimension. Uh, and then you know these these newer DJI um, cameras are roughly 20 megapixels. So um, you have that distance there, about half an inch, and then you have this distance here, which in the Phantom 4 Pro, for example, is about eight millimeters. Um, so you have, and I'm sorry, I go back and forth between uh, metric and, and SI units a lot, uh, or uh, Imperial units a lot, because uh, they get published there and I never knew who I'm talking to. But um, that relation there, um, you know, basic geometry from middle school uh, is the rule of similar triangles, essentially. So you have this distance, you have this height. Now, if you're 100 feet up in the air, this distance here, the, the, the working distance, um, that would be 100 feet. And then this would be the X that you're solving for, which would give you the dimensions of the image footprint. Um, so you do some math, you say, you know, half an inch is to eight millimeters as a hundred feet is to whatever. And yes, I'm going back and forth in units. Uh, it sort of doesn't matter. It's the distance away. It's the distance away from the lens to the sensor divided by the size of the sensor and the distance away from the object divided by, and that'll give you the height of the object because you know the relationship on, on this end. So, um, you know, that, that, kind of there's a nice animated version of it uh, i didn't want to do that quite for today but if we look here to the um this is an example of what focal length is so um this is from the nikon site uh it's a pretty cool little uh, uh let me post these did i post that hang on i'm gonna post these links uh in the chat for posterity's sake um so this link on the nikon site it's Nikkor lenses, Nikon cameras. Um, it allows you to adjust this slider, which simulates a longer focal length lens. So if you see where I am on the slider, right now it says 250 millimeters. So that's a very long zoom lens. This is allowing it to simulate out to like a thousand millimeters, which is kind of ridiculous. But you've seen those uh, those lenses on the side of sports fields that are like, two or three feet long, that's that's a thousand millimeter lens. So th those cost big bucks. We're talking about lenses that are, you know, with the small sensors, uh, the focal length usually end up being in the millimeters, like four, six, 10, stuff like that. So, um, but what you can kind of do with this is play with the, you know, it gives you a sense because uh, there's this viewer in the middle and the angle of view here. So the longer the field of view is, the narrower the angle of view is, or the longer the focal length is, the, long, the narrower the angle of view is in the field of view. Um, so if you have cameras like the Mavic 2 Enterprise and the Mavic, 2, Mavic Zoom, uh, they will allow you to adjust this, I think between 12 and 48 millimeters, something like that. I'm not super sure. Um, I've got a question here. Yeah, we're going to hold off on uh, that question for a bit. So um, again, this is a webinar format. So this is kind of educational for a large group of people um, asking specific questions. Um, we'll have a time for that in a little bit. So um, so this is all just kind of camera general stuff. 
Um, here's another, you know, so we've talked about the angle, which is the image composition. Um, we've talked about, you know, the, the sensor and how, how we define the image footprint or what you're looking at on the ground. This is a, um, a kind of cheat sheet for what the other camera uh, parameters are. There is an aperture. There is a, a aperture setting, which you can do on some of the newer DJ, DJI cameras. There's a shutter value, which is uh, available on most, I think all of them at this point, uh, any, any that people are gonna be using for mapping and an ISO value. So the important things to see here are basically for drone stuff, you generally want the largest aperture it will allow you to get. Um, I think the DJI cameras top out at like F2.7 or something like that. So you're kind of already in this area, but you're generally working pretty far away. Um, so the depth of the field doesn't matter as much. Uh, it does make it a little harder to focus if you're using an X7 camera with a long focal length lens. But if you have a, um, you know, f2.8 lens, um, we now offer a shutter priority or a, a aperture priority mode that you can set it to. And what that will do is get the most light into your camera you can possibly get in. As you can see, as, as you're using higher and higher numbers, the, the aperture, the hole is getting smaller and that's letting in less light. And you almost never want less light uh, when you're drone mapping, um, except for when you're operating on sand and snow and like bright, 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 bright stuff. Um, every now and then people are like, oh yeah, I'm flying with this ND50 lens. It's like, no, 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 no. You want all the light you possibly can. So, you're, so you're, uh, your so your integration times or shutter times are as short as possible. Um, and that's the amount of time which the sensor is exposed to light and is basically accumulating light to give you whatever value you end up with at the end. The ISO is kind of like this weird hangover from film. Uh, it does have a, a, a film analog. Uh, if you use really fast film, uh, you know, in a, in a film camera, it's very large cell um, and it tends to be, you know, give you a grainier image, but it allows you to shoot sports and, you know, real fast action things that the light may not be there. Um, but you can see in this thing here, generally you want to be mapping at ISO 100, ISO 1 or 200, ISO 400, maybe. I don't like seeing things uh, above ISO 800 generally, um, mostly because it starts to get too grainy and it affects the, uh, the feature matching capabilities of, of whatever software you're using. No one, no, no, no online processor or software wants to see grainy pictures. So, um, all right, I am now going to ask uh, if anybody has any questions on uh, just general camera stuff. I'm trying to breeze through this, and it already took 20 minutes. So, um, yeah, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and kind of blurt it out um, so I don't have to keep an eye on the questions tab. Um, I'm going to try to pick the speed up here. Uh, this is sensors. Um, we kind of talked about the, the sensor array, so you can see, don't worry about the color, um, that kind of gets taken care of by the camera, but um, you can see the smaller, this is, I'll share this link. Um, this is kind of a, um, it, it shows you that you'll get better, better representation of what you're looking at the more pixels you have. Um, kind of like if you look at a car from above with four pixels on your camera, it's going to look like four big blocks. If you look at it with 20 pixels, it might be able to tell it's a car, but probably not. If you put 100 pixels on it, you'll be able to tell it's a car. And if you put 400 pixels on it, you'll be able to tell what kind of car it is. Um, so this all comes down to the, you know, having to balance the level of detail required versus what you actually need because processing too much data uh, costs everybody more money and it costs, you know, it's more system system requirements or uh, system resources and things like that. So, um, uh, so when we're talking about aerial imaging, we are generally looking at, you know, looking down at the ground, collecting images that overlap with each other so you can get the multiple views uh, that are shown here 
so you can get these these multiple views of things. Um, and you want them to be overlapping. Uh, you want them to have roughly 75, consider 75% um, a, a minimum overlap. People try to get away with less and it doesn't turn out. And they're like, why didn't my job turn out? Well, it's because you didn't use enough overlap. Um, so we're gonna go into overlap because overlap is really the key to all of this. Um, if you have bad overlap, it's not gonna turn out well. Um, and you wasted your time in the field and then you're wasting processing resources and things like that. So take how much overlap you think you need and add five or 10% to it, um, just to make sure you're getting enough looks at everything. So, you know, it comes down to looks. Um, we want at least 15 looks. 15 looks is like, you're probably gonna get a pretty good result with 15 looks. With 10 looks, probably not gonna get a, gonna, gonna get a very good result. Um, eight looks, five looks, it's not gonna work. Uh, you might get nothing. You might get an error that says, no, we can't match things. Um, there are different ways to do aerial mapping um, that use lower overlap that are not using photogrammetry. They're using uh, image projection and merging. So you can do that. Uh, you'll end up with, you know, then it becomes an issue of blending your edges and features not matching up quite exactly. Um, you know, so photogrammetry, it requires more source data. It requires more processing, but you have less kind of bad stuff to deal with at the end. Um, so it, in order to calculate your image footprint uh, or your overlap, you need to know what your footprint is. And I'm not gonna go into all the equations here, but you know, we kind of showed the, the double triangle thing here. Um, you know, so we're defining this size in X and Y. So it's the sensor size or the sensor size of the, of the sensor, which you can get by taking the pixel pitch, which is the size of pixels. Pixels are generally, uh, most of the DJI cameras, there are a few microns, like four or five. Um, mm -hmm. Micron being a thousandth of a millimeter. So they're very small. Um, and that basically gives you the size of the sensor in X and Y, and then you use the focal length, uh, this number, to calculate what you're gonna get out here. So, uh, I have an example here, and this example is not just for focal length, but it has a cool clickable uh, has a cool clickable um, uh, example of it. So this is our tag pilot system, which is a different thing, but um, it shows that an image was taken. Here's the image here, and you can see the footprint or where it was looking on the ground here, um, and this is the thermal view of it, which is using a narrower field of view. So if I switch back and forth between the two of these, you can see the change in the size of the field of view. And that's because they have different camera parameters. So we have to take that size and this is all just how to calculate the image footprint. This is just a demonstration of that. But if you take that size, did I share that like I did? Okay. so. You know, this all comes down to overlap. And we have an animation on our site that's been there for since we did our Kickstarter uh, like five years ago or something like that, uh, that demonstrates um, how to or what overlap is doing. So it's going to restart here. So let's watch it go through. So the drone takes off. Generally, we don't image on the way up like it does there, but you take overlapping images and then turn and come back and take overlapping images this way. And you're going to turn around and do it again. And you can see that it's kind of getting darker and darker green um, as you go through this. And what that's doing, you know, the darker green that is, it's the more coverage that specific area has. Um, so here's an example of, um, let me share this window, this. So here's an example of a uh, image stack that um, was taken at about 75% overlap. So, you know, look at this, uh, this little circle, or, or look at this tree here. This is what I like to do. I like to, oop, there we go. I like to look at a tree and then track it through. So you can see, man, I keep hitting zoom. Okay, so where's the tree? So right now it's at the top of the screen and now it's a little more than halfway through 
three quarters of the way through and then kind of off the screen. So that was basically four shots to get across. So that's 75% overlap. Um, if you count five locations across the screen, that's 80% overlap. If you get 10 locations across or nine, 10 locations across the screen, screen that's 90% overlap. 75% uh, overlap turns into 75% overlap in the along track direction and the across track direction will turn into 16 looks at everything. And that's why we say to use at least 75% overlap because then you're giving our system or whatever system 16 looks at the uh, source imagery. So uh, with 75% overlap, you get 16. With 80% overlap, which gives you five, you know, as, as I tick through, uh, you get five times five, so you get 25 looks. So that's significantly more looks. That's, you know, two thirds more looks uh, for going up 10%. And some people are like, okay, well, the more the better. How about 90%? That's too far, don't do that. So that basically turns into 81 looks. Um, and that just takes forever to process. Uh, and it basically isn't any better. Um, so the most we say to use is like 85%. Um, some of the people doing trees will need to use 85%. Um, that's due to elevation changes and things like that. But the 85% number um, is about as high as you want to go. And that equates to 49 looks at everything, uh, which is overkill so you know if you have a question if you know 80 percent it's not going to work for you your next shot should be like 82 percent or 83 percent not you don't have to jump all the way up to 85 is what i'm saying so um if you want to look at that data you can uh the uh dr the drone mapping animation was here i'm giving i'm putting the links in the chat if you want to follow up on those um i would i was using ImageJ, which is an image processing software uh, that lets you kind of hammer through the images real quick. Um, I was just doing that with the left and right side keys. But if you want to look, if you want to look at a, a GIF of that, you can look at that there. Um, so this is now. We're going to switch over to the point estimator, which is a, which is something on our site that allows you to. Um, estimate how many points it's called the point estimator so we charge by the point of images of imagery that we process um, this also is a pretty good representation of rack double click right click um, of focal length and overlap and the things you need to do there so um, you can change the height let's fly at 120 meters uh, don't worry about the speed let's keep that where it is so so the blue dot is the takeoff location. We have this little wing thing here. Um, this is real old. Um, this is basically a variant of a calculator that we have been using for like, I don't know, 15 years or something like that to figure out how much data and how fast to fly and all this stuff. So um, we like to take the overlap, 75. So let's update it. So you can see it updated when I updated that. So the pass overlap, is the so the passes got closer together when there's more overlap if i take this down to 50 percent you get less so forward overlap we'd be getting four looks along the path of travel and then we would get, be getting two looks pass to pass so that multiply it and you get eight looks this is not enough overlap to do things so we're going to change that back to 75 um, and what it's doing here on the right is calculating uh, the number of images, the number of passes, roughly how long it's going to take, uh, the GSD, uh, ground sampling distance, how far it's going to fly, and how many points it would cost to process on our system. So, and you can kind of see here that it gets greener and greener and greener. This green is roughly 16, uh, 16 looks. You can see it gets less, less green as you go out here. So the, the edge data, you're always kind of getting less data out there but if this is the area we care about the red area and this is not how we fly this probably needs to be updated this was done for the kickstarter too um, but you can change you know if you're using a different camera you can pick your your camera here and you can see how that affects things uh, it has the focal length of the camera the uh, pixel size the resolution blah 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 so you can 
It calculates the sensor size. Basically, it's calculating all the stuff that we use to do stuff. And then there's even more information here. Um, it's a fun toy to play with and learn things. And uh, if you think you want to check out, you know, roughly how many points an area that you know ahead of time is going to be, um, it's not accurate. It overestimates. Um, the most accurate estimate you're going to get is by actually using MapPilot to do it. But if you want to play with this ahead of time, uh, I highly recommend it as an educational experience for everybody. So that is the point estimator. Did I put the share? Nope. Okay. So the link for that is in the chat. And um, so overlap reports. We've talked about overlap reports now. Um, anytime somebody who is mapping um, emails us for support, the support staff, the first thing they do is scroll to the bottom and look at the overlap report. You know, oh, I took 487 images and it didn't cut, turn out as well as I wanted. So, you know, you look down at the overlap report and if it's not all blue, like you're seeing here, it's like not enough overlap. If it looks like this, if there's reds and greens and yellows, um, that's bad. Um, there's probably gonna be things wrong with the 3D model. Um, you know, it, the data collection guidelines, uh, which you have to agree to before running stuff through our system, uh, tell you to use 75% overlap. MapPilot tells you to use at least 75% overlap. Uh, there are cases when you need more, like when there's trees and things involved. Um, there are cases, I, I'm, don't do this, but there are cases where 60% overlap works um, if you're flying very high um, and using big GSD and a wide field of view lens, 60 over 60% overlap will give you something. Uh, it may not be reliable. I wouldn't recommend doing it on a regular basis. Um, but, you know, this is good looking overlap. It's blue. Uh, this is bad looking overlap, but at least they tried. Uh, then there's like crazy stuff like this, like free flying. Um, you know, some things are getting more overlap. Some things are getting less overlap. Uh, obviously, that looks like crap. Uh, if there's gaps in the imaging, you can see that there's holes. So the black dots in an overlap report uh, show where an image was taken. If there's a red dot in the overlap report, that is an image that was taken but is not included in the output. Uh, reasons an image won't be included in the output are it doesn't have enough uh, feature matches to, uh, to match with the surrounding stuff. And usually you'll get them in clusters. Um, this turned out uh, there's still gaps. Um, you know, here's an interesting example of somebody who tried. They, they, they tried. Um, you can see what they were shooting. It's this weird curvy building thing. But I think it's a really good example of, um, of reasons you don't get enough overlap. So this is an elevation difference overlap um, reduction. So when you say, OK, I want 75% overlap, that 75% overlap the flight the flight gets programmed before you take off and it just goes and does it it doesn't know what is under the aircraft at that point there could be buildings there could be hills there could be trees there could be all sorts of stuff so in this case there's this big weird curvy building evil layer thing i have no idea where the where it is this has been on here forever but uh you can see what it did to the overlap report and right here in the middle right at its tallest spot uh it almost fell apart and so this guy used about 65% overlap, probably, uh, you know, used regular spacing of the images. It would have worked out, or it ended up working out fine. He basically got lucky. Um, but the 60, the, that overlap is calculated and the spacing of the images and, you know, spacing of the passes and everything is calculated for the ground level. It doesn't take into account raised up terrain or structures or anything. So you have to account for that uh, when you're doing overlap. And you know you can put in 80% overlap. This guy could have used 75% overlap and it would still probably be red and stuff around in here. Um, you know, so that you really have to kind of say, okay, how tall is that thing? How tall am I flying? You know, if, the, if the, one of the um, data collection guidelines is that you're flying four to five times as high as the tallest thing in the survey area. So if you're shooting a house that's 35, 40 feet tall and you're flying at 80 feet, it's not going to be enough. You need to be flying at 
40 feet times four or four or five, so 150, 200 feet, something like that, uh, to get up to the 150 feet above it. Or you can use a ton of overlap. So it, it all kind of comes together and it, it, like it's all interrelated. And that's where people just going out and free flying, it doesn't really work super well. So you really want to use an app to control this. Um, so this is an example of why we uh, introduced our terrain. Uh, you can see that they flew up the hill and the closer the, air, the aircraft got to the terrain level, um, the less overlap um, they ended up getting. And our system ended up stitching the areas it had enough for. Uh, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes it gets dropped out. But um, you know that's an example of that and what you get there. And you can kind of see that as the terrain goes up, the overlap went down. Um, and then you can have too much overlap. So as, as I said, if you use 90% overlap, the whole thing is going to be purple. And it's it, like this was 320 or 921, 321 images. So 321 images probably took like two and a half days to process because it's checking so many points because almost every single point in that map or in that job is going to be in almost every single image. Um, we've had this happen in pit mines and things like that, that almost every picture that was uploaded for processing had the bottom of the pit in it. Uh, so it just took forever. Uh, and so that's kind of waste, a waste of resources because um, they would have gotten a ton of overlap if they would have started at the, at the rim and done like 50% overlap at the rim. If they're interested in the stuff at the bottom, not, not 50, but probably like 60, they would have ended up with, you know, 95% overlap at the bottom. Uh, they started with 80 at the top, so it just got more and more there. So um, we don't like seeing it when people do that because you know we we pay per our processing at this point. So um, you know it's it's a waste of resources and it's a waste of time. Um, so this person probably could could have gotten away with a quarter of those images. Um, so if this happens and you see this in your data set, you can basically maybe upload half the data, every other picture or something like that or selectively remove it. But overlap really is the primary driver uh, of the quality of the outputs that Maps Made Easy will provide. And that's the same with everything, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so finding the proper balance between processing costs and quality is the key to kind of successful drone mapping. Um, any questions at this point? I'm gonna share the overlap report today. Okay, I just did that. Yep, there we go. I can do it this way. So I know all there we go. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, so we're gonna. Yeah, I wish the chat was like more chatty. I don't understand. So, um, all right, so that is basically camera stuff, and that took a whole lot of time. Um, so. The, the last thing that that matters is uh, is GSD, um, ground sampling distance. And what that is, is the level of detail you're getting. So if you are looking for cars or people, uh, you know, you might get away with one to two inch GSD um, because those things are kind of big and you need, you. It, Basically, for automated uh, image processing uh, and detection algorithms, the more pixels on target, the better. But you know, up to a certain point. But if you're looking for um, you know big features, you know one to two inch GSD is probably pretty good. Um, if you're looking, you know, we talked about cars before. If you have like two foot GSD and you're looking for cars, that's not going to work. You're not going to find people. You might find football fields with two foot GSD. Um, but if you're looking for, you know, a lot of people are doing agriculture. If you're looking for like defects on plants, you know, or, or bugs on plants, you know, where you're looking for a mite that might be um, like half a millimeter in size, um, you would need to have, if it, if it was half a millimeter in size, you would need to have tenth of a millimeter GSD or something like that. So what you're looking for should drive the level of detail you're collecting. 
because the more the more image the more imagery and the more pixels you're processing, the longer it's going to take, the more processing resources you need. Um, so we have this on our page just for uh, a demonstration as to what GSD is and like how it relates to to coverage of an area. Um, it allows you to fly faster if you're flying higher. Um, you know, because flying higher uh, expands this distance. So it makes the image footprint bigger. So it makes your GSD bigger. And where was I? Right here. So, um, you know, with three inch, you know, this is a resolution sample with maps, you know, so the MAPS right here, if that was in 10 inch letters and you had three inch GSD, you'd get three or four pixels on the M here. You can't really read it. If you had two inch GSD, you would have, you know, five or six pixels on maps. And you can kind of make out an M there, right? Like it, it looks any. So, but with one inch GSD, it's like, oh, I can read that. So, you know, it's, it's how much detail do you need? Did you need to read maps? Do you, or do you need to read this bottom line? Because with the bottom line, you can kind of read it with half an inch, but not with two. So you can kind of see the, the changes there. Um, and what it's basically the level of detail on the ground. So you can take, you know, 10,000 pixel by 10,000 pixel image and you can cover a car with it and be able to see every little scratch and dent in that car. Or you can take 10,000 by 10,000 pixels and cover a field with it. And you're going to get like, you know, a square foot or something like that, um, you know, per pixel. Um, so it's all just managing the level of detail, managing, you know, your, your ability to process data and how much you want to pay or how much, uh, you know, computing resources you have on your, on your processing computer. All right. So uh, that is the end of the introduction. And it took significantly longer than I expected, but it's, um, you know, going to be good information for a lot of people. Hopefully you can refer back to this. We're going to have the video up online. Um, any questions, uh, stick them in there now. I am going to move on to um, the map pilot section of, the, uh, of this. So data collection, you know, they, we, we look at things as there being two, two phases to things. And there's really a planning phase and a, you know, a, 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 a logistical phase where you're getting your, um, you know, your, your permitting and things lined up. But as far as we cover, um, we do the data collection side of things and we do the processing side of things. So the data collection side of things, we, um, I think we were the first or the second uh, app in the app store um, for flying an aircraft. Um, you know, I think Pix4D um, did a good job, um, you know, getting something out there for the back in the days of the, what was the first one that did it? I think it was a Phantom Vision, Phantom Vision 2 Plus, something like that. But um, once they took the Wi-Fi links out of things um, and started adding the, um, started adding the, um, the the lightning cable, the direct remote connection. That's when we're like, okay, we'll we'll, we'll play with this now. So um, we created Map Pilot. Um, the goal was basically we already had Maps Made Easy, and the biggest problem for people using Maps Made Easy was the. Um, uh, let me switch back here. Uh, the biggest problem for Maps Made Easy was the um, uh, people collecting their data. Uh, at that point, a lot of the data wasn't tagged with GPS data. So if, um, I don't, it, most of you probably know this, but within all the pictures you take, there's the picture data, the pixel data uh, that you see, and then you can view the tags. Um, we have a pretty I'll post the link, the link of the thing we use to, that, like a web thing we use to uh, inspect tags. Um, I'll post that here. We're not going to go over it because it's kind of out of spec or out of uh, scope for this. But um, if you want to look at that, you can look at some of your images and you can see the the hidden tag data that's it's in the EXIF header um, and the XMP headers uh, that are um, embedded in the image that aren't displayed. It's kind of hidden hidden information. So that's where the GPS coordinates go and the elevation uh, for all the images, and that's where we get our 
information that we use for knowing where the images are taken, which is then used for kind of creating the 3D model, which is then textured to create the maps and models and things like that. Um, so with MapPilot, the goal was to make this easier. Um, back then it was, eh, go fly over there and then come back and then go back that way and kind of 30 or 40 meters apart, it was pretty hard. Um, and then the tags weren't there and it, it, was, it was a lot of hand waving just to get people's data into Maps Made Easy. So we offer MapPilot. MapPilot has, we have a, a quick start guide, which is getting a little old. Um, we need to, we have a, MapPilot 5.0 will be coming out in, before summer. Um, we're moving some things around and we're gonna redo all of the documentation after that comes out. Um, but this quick start guide, there are things in it that are not right. Um, we hear about it frequently, um, but um, it's, it's good for letting you know generally how it operates. There are things in the app that are slightly different at this point. Um, we have five different versions of MapPilot. Um, so th this link I just gave is our support site. It's support.dronesmadeeasy.com. Um, it has articles on MapPilot, TagPilot, Maps Made Easy, our Ninja system, uh, some other stuff, MapPilot Ag, which is a new version. Um, but all of a lot of this stuff is out of there. Um, you know, so that's why I'm giving you the links because please read it. Uh, but this most recent version is a uh, comparison chart of um, the different versions of Maps Made Easy, uh, or Map Pilot, sorry. Um, we have the light version. Basically, we, we, offer, we offered Map Pilot initially, and then we added some in-app purchases to it uh, as we added new uh, features. Um, I'm actually going to share this uh, there. There. So, am I, can you see that? Medicaid. Okay. So uh, this is a article on the support forum about how or what versions of MapPilot are available. We have MapPilot, which was the original version, and then we added. We started adding in-app purchases that were ten dollars, twenty dollars, whatever. Um, they some businesses then are not able to make in-app purchases. So the in-app purchases became a problem. And so we're like, okay, well, let's make business. So we offer the business version that includes everything uh, that we offer um, in, in, in that version. And then we had people that were like, oh, I bought this version and I wanted this version. I can't get a refund on the old stuff. So eventually, and, and to bring more people into using MapPilot, we offered the light version. So this came out uh, maybe a year ago. Um, and basically it has everything you need to get started for free, uh, it uses 75 to 80, but you are limited as to what you can do um, off of the main core of things. It doesn't have the terrain awareness and linear flight planning, but you also have to pay if you want to use anything outside of our recommended uh, overlap. We want you to use 75% to 85% overlap. So that's what light allows you to do. If you want to use 70, you have to pay for it because we don't want that. So, um, you know, it, and it lets you fly higher, it lets you save missions, it lets you change the gimbal angle, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it kind of light, you can, this uh, screen up here is the upgrade kiosk, which is available in the settings of MapPilot. Um, at this point, we're recommending that everybody start with the light version. Uh, if you like things, you can buy it piecemeal, and then you can, it adjusts the price to upgrade to MapPilot and then it adjusts the price to upgrade to MapPilot business. So as you get started or wherever you are, you can kind of buy the features you want. Um, you're not gonna pay more. You're not gonna pay for things twice. You're not gonna need refunds from the app store. Uh, you're not gonna have to write angry emails to iTunes and say, uh, why can't I get a refund for this thing? Cause I just bought this. It's separate apps as far as the app store is con concerned. Um, and they don't give refunds and people get angry, so we made light. And um, it's kind of where we we wish we could get rid of MapPilot, MapPilot business now and just have everybody on light, but that would make it so everybody has to repurchase the features again. So um, that won't be happening. We're gonna continue going, but basically it is the exact same app. Uh, certain things are enabled, certain things are disabled, 
but that's pretty much it. So um, that's the upgrade kiosk. We've looked at um, looked at the, uh, the the different versions. Um, I don't know how many of you have used it and have not. Um, here is a video from the Quick Start Guide. I don't know. I, I don't know if it's from the Quick Start Guide or from the. Uh, um, I think there's like a video. I, I could probably look. So here oh, it's in the planning and flight demo. So it's it's this link here. Um, it basically tells you what's going on and shows a live demonstration of what the aircraft is doing, what the screen generally looks like. And this was put out at version 1.4, which was probably a really long time ago, like 2016 or something. So, um, okay. Well, now we're going to go and I will share my app screen, this one. So, that there we go. Oops. Sorry, I got to shuffle my stuff around here. Um, wow, that did not work. Come back. There we go. Okay, so um, you should all be able to see. Uh, this is live on my phone currently. Um, so um, I can also highlight things as we go through. Uh, I am going to move this here. It's taking up a lot of room on my screen, so I kind of have to rethink what I'm doing here. Um, so this is, you buy MapPilot, MapPilot Lite, MapPilot Business, uh, MapPilot Ag, which is now a version if you're using a Sony uh, multi-spectral camera. But um, at this point, this is what's available here. So you have the, the create new mission screen, that's the, the business end, that's what you're using when you're flying, when you're planning missions. Uh, this is the file manager. Um, we'll come back to the, the mission. I cannot click on the screen. I have to do it on my phone. Um, so this is the file manager. This is where log files. So every time you fly, you'll see a .csv log file in there. You'll get a KML file uh, that you can tap. So I'm doing a long press on that. And you can uh, email and airdrop um, files out of the file manager. You can email and airdrop into the file manager. So this, this Balboa Park Recreation.kml is a file that I got out of my email. Um, so you click on, oh, that got all wacky. So you click for importing a KML file, you click on the file in your email, you click on the little doodad up there in the top right, you do more, and then you select map pilot, and then it opens, and then it is in your, uh, it was already in there, but that's how you do it. Um, so you can kind of do that to get files in and out. There's a couple different file types you can use. Um, we have support for GeoJSON files um, that is undocumented. It's actually part of uh, MapPilot Ag. I think you can read about it in that article set. I'm not super sure if that's been updated yet, but the, um, you can get files in and out of here uh, is the main point. Uh, there are also things you can sync into here from Maps Made Easy. You can define a boundary in Maps Made Easy by uh, from the where is that? It's in the Map Pilot Boundaries section. So uh, let me let, we'll do that real quick. Hang on, sort of off topic, but it's a new feature that is documented. I'm going to do this. Uh, we're going to do spatial locker. Don't look at that. That's new. Uh, boundaries. And I don't know what all that stuff is. Uh, we're going to make a boundary group. So you make a boundary group. Um, let's go to San Diego. Let's go to this park here, Waterfront Park. We're gonna create a new boundary group. So now you have a boundary group. Now you can, we'll change this to Waterfront Park. New boundary. And we will, oh, that's not Waterfront Park. I picked the wrong park. <laughs> 
So you pick the polygon. We're going to just do an area here and create new boundary. And then we're going to go back on uh, that uh, new boundary and then create a polygon. We're going to do Cardia Snack Shack because it's delicious. And you can drink beer down by the water. And uh, Arnitas. So then uh, in the map pilot, this is all sort of new stuff. Um, you can read about it in, uh, yeah, yeah, where'd it go? This is all added, we're, we're adding a lot of new stuff soon. Uh, this is kind of stuff that we've kind of leaked out um, for documentation for certain groups of people. Um, Managing missions flight sync. So this is the flight sync session, section. Uh, you can sync boundaries, you can sync flights, you can sync missions, you can sync lots of stuff. So now that that is in there, um, yikes, okay. I might have this off. I'm not even logged in. <laughs> so let's go over here real quick. So that's the flight sync section. I'm going to go here. I'm logging in. I just didn't want to see my password. Okay. Thought I was logged in. Sorry about that. Uh, we're going to turn that on while we're in here. Uh, we're going to go back to file manager. So uh, do you need to see this? That. Okay, so now we are back in the file manager, we are logged in, and now you can see that the upper right-hand corner says sync. Uh, you can hit sync, and uh, Waterfront Park is now in the boundaries, Carnitas, so it shows Carnitas. So uh, there's the boundary, we just made Maps Made Easy and synced in, and now you just double click and it shows you a, a program flight plan for that area. So that's the kind of stuff you do in uh, in the um, file manager, the mission plans management. Well, let's see. Uh, I'm just going to hit sync because there's nothing in there. And um, so these are whatever missions I have in here from testing. I don't know what. Uh, okay, so that pop up was saying I need to delete the active camo file. Um, so this is a saved mission that was synced in from Maps Made Easy. Um, we can. Um, Basically, there's a bunch of those in there. Um, if you want to search for things, you can search by location, near me. Um, uh, let's see if I have one park. Do I have one called the park? Nope. But, oh, High Lakes Pac-Man farts. Okay, good naming. Oops. Anyway, so, um, right, so that's the mission plans uh, when you save a mission it will go into the mission plans and then you can sync it and it will go up to maps made easy and then you can log in on a different device and share things that way um, so then there's the settings the settings is um, don't worry about that um, generally you're going to be using like the phantom 4 pro uh, kind of stuff which is at this point our favorite aircraft if people want to know. Oh crap, a bunch of questions, sorry. Uh, let me get these out of here. Um, so I got a question, can you do this on, can we get this on Android? The answer is no, sorry. Um, we might someday, but um, no. Um, am I able to export AirDrop more than one file at a time? No. Um, but you can sync it in and out using Maps Made Easy. Uh, so we didn't add the multiple. Uh, this is uh, Chris S. Uh, his his question. I should be. No, I'm sorry. So the way to handle all stuff. Uh, okay, whatever. So the way to handle lots of. They were asking about whether you can back up and um, save missions as a group, um, which 
used to be done with something, it was a file. Apple said that that file type is not something that we should be um, sh sharing with um, the app audience. It's not a, it's not something you use with them. So, um, so we have this new system to do this and, uh, Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we have this new system to uh, to sync it all, so that should fix it. Um, I have a question: the, Is there support coming for the Mavic Mini? Uh, we have not added support for the Mavic Mini on purpose, uh, mostly because the camera kind of sucks. Um, sorry, DJI. Uh, you know, it costs four hundred dollars, so you're only going to get so much quality. The optics are super small. The camera, the sensor is low resolution. It has a pretty slow rolling shutter. There's a lot of problems with it. Um, it's not suitable for mapping, so we haven't added support for it in Maps Made Easy because honestly, we don't want to see the data from it because we're still dealing with the Mavic Air being supported. Uh, people post data from the Mavic Air and are like, oh, why did it turn out like crap? It turned out like crap because you're using the Mavic Air. Um, so the Mavic Mini is less good, so we're just not even going to go there at this point. We're adding support to it to the Tag Pilot application uh, because it has a place there, but Honestly, they shouldn't be used for mapping. Um, all right, so settings, pick your camera, do like metric units. Um, movable home point uh, is something that if you're doing a linear mission from one point to another, you can enable movable home point and basically the remote will, the, the home point for the aircraft will update and show as a yellow dot. Um, you can read about that. It, all of this stuff in the settings is documented in the uh, map pilot or in the support setting. So I'm not going to go super into that. Uh, show image footprint. We talked a lot about the image footprint. Basically, that puts a green square down that shows on the map where it is um, uh, looking. Um, it's nice. It doesn't help anything, um, but it is nice. It's a good sanity check for people. Um, show nearby catch missions. So I showed something. What did I show? Um, it had like a bunch of yellow lines. Uh, if you save, uh, so if I save a mission, so now that I have like, you know, a million missions logged in here and I look at my, erase that, um, and I look at my current location, you can see all the, uh, all the missions. It's like I uh, test it here a lot. Um, so that's the, um, show adjacent missions. You can turn that off. Um, it's helpful if you're laying out, if you're if you have a really large area to map uh, and you want to break it up into four, we recommend having them overlap by about two passes worth or a few images worth. Um, so you're having having them show in adjacent missions. Um, you know you can help line those up. But if you're doing a whole lot of stuff in one place like uh, that, like I just showed you, it looks like crap and it gets too crazy so um you can hide it if you're if you're concerned uh third party data source well that's something email us if you want to know about it uh it's documented in the share site you can use uh arcgis tile sources uh map box share tile sources we're gonna have a new uh data source type uh coming up in a little bit that's comp uh that's compatible with other stuff um here's the maps made easy login um you can control whether your uh, flight sync data, which is your log files, you can control whether those are going to get uh, sent up to the server by. Um, um, you can control whether that gets sent up automatically or not, um, and whether the stuff gets synced. Um, the, the, basically, these are your privacy controls. Um, I did just get a question whether it's possible to import a third party map. Instead of Google Maps, uh, yes, and that's what you would uh, do with the uh, Mapbox share URL or the ArcGIS URL. Um, there's a lot of settings on the ArcGIS stuff, and honestly, we don't use it. So uh, people, it works, and people use it. Um, the Mapbox share URL, URL is a little easier to use, and pretty soon we're going to be adding basically a custom tile source, so you can use Map Tiler or you can even use Maps Made Easy maps as your base map if you wanted to. Basically, any, anywhere that has a uh, you know X Y Z uh, tile source URL, uh, you would be able to punch in there and, and have it share it. Uh, air data. Uh, so if air, air data or healthy drones, uh, you can go to your profile there and type in uh, a number and your your 
share token and your flight logs will be automatically uploaded to them. Uh, there's the Lance system, um, which I think is only available in the US. Um, I should know because we applied to do a bunch of stuff with it, but uh, I forget. So um, that basically is for getting authorizations. What is it? It's low altitude authorization something. Uh, but basically, it goes through the AirMap app and passes your flight plan information to AirMap, and they then pass it to um, air traffic control in whatever area you're operating in to ask them if uh, it's okay for you to fly. And sometimes you can get automated uh, authorizations, which is cool. Other times it says you have to call. Um, it's it works. It's a it, it, the whole land system is just now getting useful. Um, it was kind of less useful previously. Um, I'm getting dings on something. I don't know what that is. Um, auto clear image points. Uh, we'll talk about them a bit. Um, advanced settings. Don't worry about that. So we're gonna go and lay out a mission. We're going to go here. We're going to do it in San Diego. So I am going to. Dirt, dirt, dirt. Sorry. You're all going to get epilepsy now. I'm not in San Diego. Do, do, do. We're going to go back down to uh, that park. I went to the wrong park. This park's cool. Um, so. When you are planning a flight, let me see where I have it. I have a checklist I'm following and I'm following it loosely. So um, in general, you buy an app pilot, you open it, now what? So assuming you're not hooked up to your aircraft yet, um, I can't be hooked up to the aircraft right now because my lightning port is taken up by the cable to the computer, which is allowing you to see what I'm seeing. So um, you, you don't have to be connected to the aircraft to plan your flight. You can double tap. So I'm going to say, I'm going to take off from this, uh, this location right here, which is big open concrete area. And I'm going to map this area. So I, what I did right there to drop this orange marker, which is an, a boundary marker, um, is a long press. And you can do a long press again. And you can do a long press again. And boom, flight plan. Cool. So now, you expand it out from the center by selecting these midpoint uh, markers that are made. Um, this allows for the creation of uh, polygon or concave polygons. Um, previously, we would only allow convex polygons that were that did not have interior points. Um, you have to be careful when you're doing concave polygons because some places it will fly over uh, to hit various things, so you kind of got to check it, but, you know, for laying it out like this, it's like, okay, that's more efficient, and it's covering that whole area. Um, so you can see it updates all that. Um, you can see in the top, so the, the left side of the app, these panels open and close uh, by tapping on the little pullout, this area, and then you put it back by swiping. So tap, swipe, tap, swipe and so this the left side is for planning purposes and the right side is for flight time so right now since i'm not connected to the aircraft the flight controls aren't going to show up the telemetry is not going to show up because we're not flying and i'm not connected so the upper left corner is the flight plan statistics um so the area it's covering is 0.81 hectares we're going to change it to acres, uh, which can be done in this map control pullout. This stuff's all going to be moved around in uh, 5.0, but uh, the icons will be the same. So this is 2.3 acres. I am, here we go. So, um, you know, a little more acreage. It tells you the, the distance you'll fly, the max speed you'll be flying, uh, how many batteries, how many images, how many points it'll take uh, to process on Maps Made Easy based on the number of images um, and the type of camera you're using. And um, so, okay, cool. Now um, you can adjust the um, altitude of the flight. So the altitude, as we noted before, with the uh, you know the the tree, the tree lens and camera diagram, um, 
this will affect the GST by since we're increasing the, the, the working distance uh, by flying higher, the GSD will get larger and the uh, spacing will all uh, get further apart. So as I increase the altitude, the passes get further apart, the speed it's gonna fly speeds up, the GSD changes. So as we go lower and lower and lower, the GSD gets smaller and smaller and smaller, but now you're flying pretty low. And basically we took that down so low that the overlap starts getting affected. So the overlap panel pops up, which brings us to the, oops, the overlap or the uh, options menu. So the options menu can be opened by um, tapping on the top status bar, uh, this part that says looking for drone. It's looking for the drone because it's not there. So it's continuously every couple seconds checking to see if one's connected. Um, the uh, simulator um, is your friend, use it. Um, basically you can test, you can plan your flights, you can test terrain awareness, you can do all this stuff while at your desk. Uh, without going out and risking the aircraft or whatever. Uh, this has the terrain aware um, controls. Uh, Active Connect is what we recommend to use um, if you can't maintain a solid uh, remote control connection because you're flying too far away, which you shouldn't be doing. Or, um, you know, you're flying along you're in trees and things like that that's really hard to maintain a, uh, a connection. You can um, use the other mode, which is connectionless. Connectionless means that the app is no longer triggering the, um, the imaging. It is done by the aircraft, either by distance triggered or time triggered, depending on the model. Um, you can also see here, this is where you change the type of mission. So you can do a normal mission, you can do a grid mission, um, which does a, a normal mission and then does another normal mission at 90 degrees. Um, People do this to capture uh, all sides of things for doing 3D modeling. I honestly don't think it helps that much, but people ask for it. We give the people what they want. Uh, a linear mission. So the order in which we drew all those pictures, I'm gonna take some of these out. Um, you can do this. That's not a very useful mission, but if we uh, did this, we could say we're mapping uh, PCH and uh, and Broadway here. Um, we'd probably hit some buildings if we did this, that'd be bad. But um, that is how you set up a line mission. It's uh, you basically drag it to where you want to start and where you want to end and then move around all the uh, interior points. Um, you swipe left and right, as the pop-up said when we first selected uh, on the status bar. Uh, to increase and decrease the number of passes. Um, we recommend using um, more passes than less. Uh, one pass, if you do one pass and you use 90% overlap, you're still only gonna get uh, nine looks, 10 looks at things. If you use 75% overlap with one pass, you're gonna get one look at things. So if you use 75% overlap, a long track and then three passes, you're still only gonna get 12 looks at things. So the data collection guidelines that we have on the site say that you should probably be using at least three passes, if not four, um, to be able to get it. If you're gonna process the data without us, if you're doing your own processing, I don't really care what you do. So it, it's, I'm just telling you, it's hard to um, put all this together to, to reconstruct any scene using photogrammetry with minimal overlap like that. If you're just trying to cover the ground and get the pictures, you can do 20% overlap and haul butt and cover the whole thing and do one pass and be done with it. And you've documented the whole the whole corridor. Um, and that's what people that are doing uh, pipeline mapping, rivers, streams, stuff like that, they're lo just looking to document it, um, not to process it through us. Uh, they just want to take the pictures and have them. Um, our new system that I, it's, uh, Spatial Walker is its current uh, name, uh, that new system will uh, help with managing data like that and allow you to do location reports and things like that. It's kind of meant to use with our tag pilot application, but you can also use 
uh, map pilot data in there and process things into flat projected uh, maps. Um, back to the uh, options menu, this top menu up here. Uh, zone control. Um, we're not connected to the aircraft, so it doesn't know where we are currently as far as, uh, basically the zone control stuff is stored on the aircraft. And this is where you control your flight authorizations through DJI's fly safe system. Um, you log into DJI, we talk to them, we get the um, authorizations in your account and the aircraft is what lets you take off or not. So it's a little goofy. Um, it mostly works, uh, that whole system is a little little goofy. But um, kind of quickly, here's the, you know, the camera control, when you're, when you're connected to the camera, um, you can pick auto, shutter priority, aperture priority, and I think that's it, I don't know. Um, and select the different ISO values and aperture values and things like that. Um, then you can select the speed of the mission. Uh, the important thing to note here is the user maximum speed. So that's like, I want I want to go fast. So like, we're gonna go 30 miles an hour, but the camera is limited to a certain amount of, uh, a certain rate. So the camera, the DJI cameras, if you have a great SD card, you can generally write images at uh, once every two seconds. Um, what that does is allow or limit how much overlap you can get depending on how high or how high you're flying uh, and how fast you're flying. So all of those three things are tightly tied together. Um, so if I come here, I'm clicking the wrong place, and I fly higher, the limited value right here is getting is going up. So if the limited value is less than the user maximum value, that's how fast it's going to fly. Um, in this particular case right here, it would fly from the purple dot, 30 miles an hour, or 29.5 .9, miles an hour to the green dot. Then it would fly 21.3 miles per hour along this whole path. And then from the red dot, which is hidden under there, uh, back to the purple dot, it would go to user maximum. So the limited value is what flies on the, on the flight path and the user maximum value is basically like as fast as you want to let it go. Sometimes when people are flying with really big like M600 systems loaded up with fancy stuff, uh, they don't like seeing it fly <laughs> super fast. So they're like, oh my God, it's terrifying to have $100,000 flying like that. So, so they can turn this value down to slow and that'll be the new value that gets flown throughout. Um, so that's how you use the speed stuff. Maximum time, um, generally people fly until the bat. So some people like to say, I only wanna do 18 minute flights. Cool. Uh, let me switch back. So I'm gonna go back to a normal mission and I'm gonna make it big. It's a little hard. Trying to keep all this stuff open. All right, so, so now we have this area here that has, there's a white line and a gray line. And over on the flight panel, this has two batteries. This basically shows the first battery will roughly take that much and the second battery will be the, the gray part. And it goes back and forth between white and gray. Um, so if you change the battery, if we go short, it takes three batteries. It goes white, gray, white. And the longer we go, it kind of estimates how, like when it's gonna come back. Um, so if you're gonna do an 18 minute battery, you can basically say, all right, go until, so taking it to the end where it says battery limited, says fly until you can't fly anymore. Um, some of these aircraft will fly for 17 minutes, some will fly for 28. DJI says they'll fly for like three hours. I don't know, they say like 30 minutes on some of them and then we've never seen anything like that. We see like 25, 24, 25 minutes for mapping stuff sometimes. Um, but basically the battery says, I have enough power to make it back X meters. And if you are now, if, if the battery says, I have enough battery to get back 900 meters, and then all of a sudden the aircraft goes out beyond 900 meters, it says, oh, we better head back now. 
and it turns and heads back and it lands. Um, that's the automated return to home uh, setup. It's generally what you should use because you're going to get the most out of the battery, but uh, understanding what is actually causing it to trigger um, is, is helpful. Um, you don't want to start flying. Uh, it, it's better to start flying far away and work towards the home point uh, to, to use more battery or to get more out of your batteries. Um, if you start close and go, go to far away, uh, kind of that decreasing radius circle uh, that the battery maintains uh, as soon as you intersect that going outwards, it's, you know, and then you're further away and then blah, blah, blah. So generally we recommend going far to near. Um, the other thing here is the offset. The offset is back when we were talking about the overlap and there being buildings and the buildings getting less overlap where the trees, the tops of the trees getting less overlap. This is a tool that could be used to raise the plane for which the overlap, you know, so if you're, if you're down here, if you're down here and there's a ground level and there's a big building right here and you want the roof of the building to turn out. The roof of the building is 50 feet above the ground, right? And you do 75% overlap here, the roof's probably gonna get like 60 or 55 or something like that, less, and it's not gonna turn out. So if you're at the ground, you can, you're getting 75% overlap at the ground. What this overlap feature lets you do, or over or offset feature allows you to do is raise that value up to 50 feet. So your build, building's 50 feet tall, and you're now calculating the 70, so the top of the building is gonna get 75% overlap instead of the ground getting 75% overlap. So lots of people map roofs and solar panels and stuff like that. So the more overlap you get on it, the better it's gonna turn out. But if you only care about the roof, don't lay the overlap out for the ground. Use the offset feature and put it up where it should be. Um, this applies for trees, for the tree people. Um, it applies for terrain, depending on what you're doing. Um, you can also go down with it. So we've had people, um, so uh, one thing to notice is as I slide this, the flight plan doesn't change the, the path spacing or anything like that. It's just moving that whole flight plan up and down. So it's adjusting the altitude of it, not the, not the, uh, uh, the, the spatial layout of it all. So, but we've had people map a low area from the top of a building. Um, so you can take this and say, okay, we'll calculate the overlap for down there, not up here. Um, so that's the offset feature. Um, all right, so, and then overlap. So overlap, 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 overlap. Um, use it, uh, you know, as it says here, 70 flat areas, few trees. 75 is kind of the sweet spot. 80s if there's terrain or structures, trees. Water, don't do water. People insist on mapping water. Water is reflective, it moves, it's... You can do it if you use a ton of overlap. Uh, and that's basically to overlap or, or overcome all the reflections and the changes and... It, it's useful to be able to map areas that have water. It just, photogrammetry is like not the way to do it. Um, the other thing that you really need to use a lot of overlap with is corn. Uh, you know, we should change trees and corn to vegetation. Um, plants, motion is bad in photogrammetry. So if you have motion in your images and the tree is swaying, the successive images aren't gonna, the features aren't gonna match anymore. Um, so don't map when it's windy. Don't map when it's, uh, you know, it's like variable light. Things that, things that change the content of the, of the or change the appearance of features um, are basically things that are gonna make your map right? and your photogrammetry basically fall apart. Um, sorry, I'm just cleaning some stuff up here. Um, so, you know, we, this is the default. The reason it went down to 66 is because I took the speed way, way up. Um, but you can see in the layout down here, a long track doesn't affect the layout. Oops, sorry. A long track doesn't affect the layout. A cross track, or 
it, it's basically checking the timing of the, the imaging rate of the camera and the height and the overlap and making sure that all that jives. But the across track overlap, um, some people call it side lap. I hate that. So I don't let anybody at our company call it side lap. So there. Um, as you increase the across track overlap, the passes get closer and closer and closer and closer. Um, so you can see what all this does. We're, we're, we're telling you what to do here. Um, what we've learned and part of the reason we don't update our documentation very often is that uh, people don't read. So, you know, we just support the questions that they come in. But, you know, even though it's right there on the overlap, people still try to get away with using 60%. Um, use lots of overlap. Um, all right. So, terrain awareness. So, there's a couple advanced features that I, I think other companies or other apps are, are doing them now. Um, we have our own terrain service, which allows us to take um, a big hill here. Um, we, we have our own terrain, terrain service, you know, as part of Maps Made Easy that allows us to take that data offline. So everything you can do in Map, Map Pilot and Maps Made Easy or Map Pilot is um, capable of being done offline. Um, so you can, as long as you you can save the base map data for offline, you can save the terrain data for offline. So when you get in the field and you have to make a change, um, all of the data that you need to make that change is there. Um, we're not using Google Elevation Service. We're not using anything online. That data is local on your device. Um, so what that allows you to do is, so here's a parking lot. It's up on the top of a big hill. Um, then we're going to map this area. Down here, this is a big canyon. This is called Florida Canyon. And it's probably a couple, it's probably 100, I'm going to guess. It is 130 feet deep. Let's see if I'm right. So we're going to come up here to the options menu. We're going to do terrain aware. We're, so this right here is, it's one of one SRTM. SRTM is Shuttle Reconnaissance Terrain Missions. Uh, it was something NASA did in the year 2000. You can read it on uh, the terrain awareness page, which is here. I've shared that in the links. Um, the terrain awareness, um, this data is uh, 98 feet per pixel. Um, people think they're like, oh my God, I need so much more detail than that. You don't. You shouldn't be flying that low if you do. Um, it's loose. Um, if you're flying off a cliff, yeah, you might want something else. Um, I would recommend doing that some other way anyway. Um, I need to set, I'll set that to zero ish. Um, so, this is different sources. So if I had a map that I had done in map, Maps Made Easy and processed this area and called it Florida Canyon Detailed DEM, um, it would show up here and say Florida Canyon Detailed DEM, and I would be able to select that. And it would basically give me another, um, another source for the data that is at four centimeters per pixel. Uh, so no, 10 centimeters, four inches. So 10 centimeters per pixel uh, data. So if you want higher resolution data for your DEM work, you can create it yourself. You can use SRTM because it's not that bad. Or you can um, create your own data, get your own data from wherever. Um, I don't know where people get a lot of it. Sometimes it's like local. Uh... I'm going to switch here real quick. Um, sometimes it's local, um, somebody that with a LIDAR system or local governments or something. Um, this here is what it looks like if you import a Maps Made Easy DEM as the, um, as the custom data source. See, it says 4 of 14. I have a lot of maps uh, for around this area. So, um, you know, and it is uh, 0.1 meter per pixel. So it's very detailed. If you need to fly up and over houses and stuff like that, like that's all there. Um, you have to, all the points have to be within 
uh, the covered area is the one kind of caveat. You can read about that there. Um, if you need other data, so you don't want to you don't want to go out and create your own map. You don't want to use SRTM. You can bring your own terrain data. Um, this is not something for the casual user. This is you know what you're doing and have a need. Um, it is not something that is on the Maps Made Easy site uh, really at all. Um, you can email us um, a web hosted link uh, to the uh, data and we will process it and put it in your account for you. Um, we just haven't, it's not something that people do often enough, but um, you know, for the, for the, for the um, timber and forestry users uh, that are listening, this may be something that is is useful for them. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so a couple of people are dropping off asking if there's going to be a recording. Uh, the answer is I think so. Um, I think it's I, I think I said it to record. Um, we'll find out. So um, wait for the process to be complete. Use your tray. So um, basically, this this version right here uh, is like a huge DEM. Um, that I found on the USGS site and uploaded to uh, Maps Made Easy. So then this, the, the terrain data, whatever it was at whatever resolution, um, will get upsampled to 0.1 meter per, se per uh, pixel. Most public uh, terrain data sources are like one meter, three meter, something like that. Um, anyway, if you need that, email us. We'll help you figure that out. Um, so uh, back to terrain. So you pick your source there, um, then you hit profile. Uh, it's going to download the terrain data. So that data is now on the uh, device. So if I go offline, if I'm on an iPad that doesn't have an internet connection, and I go offline, um, I can go um, and, uh, and, and change the terrain profile out in the field. And we'll do that in a second. So you can turn this plot on and off by hitting the plot button, plot on, off, on. Uh, let's see how high it was. It was a 151 meters as the minimum and two, four, well, I was off by like meters to feet. So shows what I know. 100, 108, I, was, I said 120 feet. It's 120, 28 or 120 meters uh, high down this canyon. So what you can do um, here is you can kind of preview what the flight will do by running your finger along here and you see this blue dot. Um, you can see this flies down there, comes back up, goes down the little hill there, goes down the canyon, comes back up. Um, so you can preview this. Um, then if I come here and I say, okay, so generally uh, to save battery and fly faster, we actually tell people to fly across hills, uh, not up and down them. Uh, flying across a hill allows you to do smaller elevation changes at any given time. You spend less time going up and down because that flight happens a lot slower. So I just changed the orientation of the flight to be across the hill, and um, it kind of what does it end up doing? Um, so it starts at the top of the hill, zigzagging its way down, it's finding its way down, finding its way down. You know, the last two passes are kind of down the hole, and it comes back up. So uh, that is the terrain awareness feature. Um, uh, we went over linear. So that is generally um, map pilot functions. Um, I have a video here that I'll share that basically shows, that's the wrong one. Oh crap, did I just show the, uh, uh, hopefully I was showing the right screen. Uh, so this is a, the, a recording of a map pilot flight with the, um, no it's not, stop it, there we go. So this is a, a screen recording and I, like iOS app, you know, device screen recording um, of it going. I wish the, uh, the camera view was up, but um, if you want a better version of this, I shared the, the YouTube link before. Um, it, it shows what you'll see, essentially. Um, yeah, so I think that is generally, um, generally 
main functions of the map pilot uh, for as far as going out and doing normal flight. Um, as I mentioned, there's the the mission saving. Oh, mission saving. We'll do a save mission. So uh, we'll get this out of the way. Um, so the mission saving uh, happens not there, right here. Um, this icon right here, the like old the the old school three and a half, three and a quarter inch floppy disk save icon. Kids these days don't know what that is. Um, you can tap that. We're gonna call this. Uh, Florida Canyon demo. Florida Canyon. Uh, it saves all the data. It saves the uh, the base map information for offline. So now, if you have this mission saved, you now have the base map information saved. You have the terrain data saved. So it's safe to unplug, go offline, go you know, no internet connection, go out to this area, and you'll be able to see what's going on on the ground and then also have the terrain data. So the save mission I just did uh, shows up in the mission plans here at the top. And so this is the saved version of it. Uh, you can tell it's saved because it has this unlock icon here. Um, so if you wanted to edit your saved mission, if you're like, ah, I don't like this cross hill thing, you tap that unlock icon, you can rotate the, the mission again, and then you can save it again or, or whatever. Um, so that's, basically that um yeah oh so every flight you do so okay you design this flight you you run it like the video is oh i was showing the video right let me show that again then sorry i was on the wrong screen um so let me go here let me go here go here So here's the, here's the flight area. We're gonna double tap on it. Okay, that looks good. So this is how you save a mission. It's this disc icon down here. I was talking and the video was playing on the other window. Um, save it. Um, most of the tiles have already been saved. And then we're gonna come over here and you can see that in the mission plans that that uh, saved mission is then there, which you can edit by unlocking and then rotating or doing whatever you need to do. Um, so you go off your fly like that video was showing and you will get a, uh, a log file in the file manager. They show up at the top above the imported KMLs and boundary groups and stuff like that. Um, those log files, if you are logged into Maps Made Easy, will go to uh, your Maps Made Easy account and show up and flights so you can go to map, map pilot flights in maps made easy and then go and see you know what what you just did um and you can get a lot of detail in uh, this is a tag pilot flight so it has kind of extra stuff um it has videos and it has the uh, elevation corrected, whatever, you know, footprints and stuff like that. Other, uh, if you're just doing map pilot flights, uh, da, 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 da. that's tag pilot. I don't know if I have any map pilot flights in here anymore. Uh, I'm sure I do somewhere. Nope. So, anyway, that's. Uh, that is the general thing. Um, uh, I have a question here. If the space is an issue on the device, is there a way to clear the downloaded cache? Uh, yes, you can uh, go here. So in your main screen, uh, the map control and do a lot. This is like a hidden feature because people ask about it like it's I don't even think it's written down. Uh, you can do a long press on the map control for like some seconds, I think. Hello? No? No? Is it long press on save? There we go. 
So if you long press on the save button, it says clear cache data and that'll do the terrain and base map stuff and clear it up. Answering that in the thing so it gets documented. Um, all right, so that is pretty much it. I, a, lot of, a bunch of people have kind of tapered off because I went over, I knew I was gonna go over. Uh, I, me I meant to do it for two hours. Um, so I think we're gonna do another section on Friday uh, for the data processing part of this. Um, and I'll send the link out for that in a bit.